today in Swift UI. Building a better text field, part two. Let's begin. Today we're going to add to what we built last time, which was, to recap, these better versions of the built-in text field. We have these toggles that we can press at the bottom, which control focus programmatically, which is something that the built-in text field does not provide us, as well as the ability to spread our mac and cheese over multiple lines instead of the single-lined text field. There is also a text editor someone actually brought up, but the text editor component, if we could take a quick look at this, this was released with iOS 14. It only has a binding to a string, so it has even less capabilities than the text field, which at least gives us a few overloads, mostly just the ability to know whether or not we're focused and handle an on-commit callback, which is run whenever we hit return. So that's all to say that I think our text field is worth it, as the, the new text editor does not provide much value. Today we're going to add a few more pieces of functionality. We're going to start by adding a placeholder. That's a nice thing to have. We're also going to add that on commit hook, which allows us to execute some function whenever the user hits enter. And then we're going to make an API decision around including a return key parameter, which will allow us to customize what this return key is right now. It just says return. But there are actually a bunch of options you have in iOS. However, these are only in iOS. So we're going to have to decide what we want to do. We'll discuss how Apple designs their APIs for use across multiple platforms, and we'll make a decision around that then. But before we go on, there's actually a problem with our current code. If I tap into this first field, add some lines, and then tap the back focused toggle, we go into this strange infinite loop, the screen starts to flicker. What's happening is that the focus is ping-ponging back and forth between the front and the back very rapidly, and the whole app seizes up. So I'm going to stop that. The problem stems from how we've designed our state here. We have a separate focus variable for both the front and the back, which allows for the possibility of them both being true. This doesn't really make any sense given how iOS focus works when there really can only be a single text field as the first responder at a time. There's a design guideline or principle which states that you want to make impossible states impossible to represent. And here, this impossible state is quite trivial to represent. We have two distinct Boolean values that could both be toggled true. One of them being false is fine or both of them being false is fine, but it's still possible to toggle them both to true. So we wish to redesign our focus state to only make it possible to represent valid states. And since there can only be a single element focus at a time, it makes sense to collapse this instead into a single field. So instead of having a front focused and a back focused, we will just have a state called focus. And then the question is, what should this be? We can assign some arbitrary value, maybe an integer, to represent the back and another integer to represent the front. However, with Swift we have enums when we want to represent a closed set of possible states. So we can actually make a custom built enum called focus that will contain within example view, and it will have a back and a front case. And this is targeted to our exact purpose. So here I'll make this state variable a focus enum, and I'll make it optional. And I'll start it out is empty. Clearly this doesn't compile right now because we need to pass in a binding to a boolean here. But this is actually just fine because we can create bindings. They're actually very simple structures. Let's make a new variable called front focus binding and this will be a binding to a boolean. And we can build a binding with its initializer, particularly the one that takes a getter and a setter function. This getter function should return a boolean that should be true when we want the front to be in focus and false when we don't. So given our new variable, we can simply check that focus is equal to front. That will return true if it's front, false otherwise. This set value is going to be called when omen text field assigns a boolean value to this binding. So this will be whether or not omen text field wants front to be focused. So we can take this value and say if is focused then focus should equal front. Otherwise, if not focused, and the current focus is equal to front, then we can set focus equal to none. Here we're adding this extra case because if the back has already taken focus, we don't want to nil out the focus parameter. Only if the front is currently focused, 
yet it tells us that it doesn't want to be focused. Should we then nil out the focus value? And now that we have this binding, we can pass it in. And that part compiles. Now we just need to do the same thing for the back. I'm just going to start out by copying this and just change every instance of front to back. And that works. But there are two more instances down here and we can reuse those same front focus binding and back focus bindings. And now let's try to run that again. So the way we got the problem before was by typing into the front field and then toggling the back focus toggle. But there's no longer a problem. We can toggle the buttons and we jump back and forth. We can turn them off. We can turn them on. Everything works just as before, except now we have made the impossible state impossible to represent by collapsing these two Boolean values into a single value which represents an optional enum. This is the semantics we want for focus. We can either have the back focused or the front focused or, because this is an optional, this adds the third possibility of nothing being focused. So we have back or front or nil. So before we move on to our actual to-do list, let's remove some of the duplication we've created. We have a front focus binding and a back focus binding, which look nearly identical. That's because we simply copy pasted the front one and changed some names in here. If we look at the implementation, we realize that the only piece of information we're using about our enum focus here is the fact that we can compare it to some built-in value. So we can actually abstract this binding transformation, which takes a binding of any equatable type, in this case the focus, and transforms it into a binding of Boolean, given some value that we want to check whether or not it's equal to. So we can abstract this into an extension method on binding. So let's copy this, go to the bottom, make a new extension on binding. Let's make a new function and call it is equal to some other value, which is going to be a generic parameter of A, and this will return us a binding of a Boolean. We'll begin just by pasting what we had from before, and everywhere we mentioned front, we will replace this with our abstract value here. And we also no longer have access to focus. Instead, we're going to use the binding that we're extending. Its current wrapped value will represent its current value. So we're going to change that. We're going to change this, this, as well as this. And we also need to help Swift out a little bit by explicitly saying that this is going to be a binding of Boolean. And now we've unlocked our next error, which says that we don't have the binary operator equals equals. We're going to have to say that A is equatable. And then we've unlocked our final error, which says that the binding's value, which is the type that the binding that we're calling this method on is wrapping, is not equal to A. So we're going to have to add a type constraint here at the end by saying where value is equal to A. But we don't just want to be able to call this on a binding of A, we want to call it on a binding of option A, such that we can set it to nil. So we're going to say that value is going to be optional of A. And now this compiles. Let's also rename is focused to something more generic, like is true. And technically, we can remove this altogether and use dollar zero. In this case, is actually somewhat redundant, because if it's not true, then it's false. So we can just make this check here, that the wrapped value is equal to the value, and this still all compiles. It's certainly a bit tricky to genericize functions like this. The type signatures get a little hairy. We have conformances to protocols, and we have these equality checks here at the type level. It's all starting to look a bit like a car crash. The trick is to first have a few concrete implementations that help you realize that an abstraction is possible, and then to mechanically abstract that concrete representation, which is exactly what we did. We copy-pasted the concrete version of this method and then just started replacing hard-coded values with more generic abstract values, which forced us to replace our concrete type of focus, the focus enum value, with the type parameter A. And because we did that, then we had to specify that it conformed to certain protocols, because when this was simply the enum focus, Swift knew that we could call double equals on it. But now that it's a generic parameter, we have to specify that it's equatable. And before we were referencing a state variable that was in scope, which was our focus variable, but we've also wanted to transform this into being an extension on binding. So we now need to constrain the value of the binding we're adding this function to, to be an optional A. So now let's use this new generic version of what we just had. We can take what we've had before, comment it out, and instead we can simply say focus dot is equal to front. And that compiles, and it's a lot simpler. Same with the back, we can replace this with focus dot is equal to back. We could even inline these at their call sites, but because we're using them in multiple places, we may as well keep these variables here. It's your choice, depends what you find more readable. But I think this is fine for now. And now that we have this extension, we can use this in any view. 
we can add our own custom focus enum for any view, adding as many cases as we need. And then in order to bind them to our text fields or to toggles or to anything else, we can simply call the is equal extension function on a focus binding and transform that into a binding of Boolean. And of course, let's run this really quickly just to make sure that we haven't broken anything. I'm typing into the front. Let's make it multi-lined. Tapping the back focus toggle, it switches. I can tap between the fields as well, and it still switches. So everything seems to be working according to plan, so we didn't break anything in our refactoring. That's the nice thing about having a somewhat powerful type system like Swift. We can make large, confusing refactorings, work ourselves through all of the errors, and as long as we weren't adding any complicated logic and just moving types around, there's a pretty good chance that everything will keep working. So let's get rid of this cruft here. We don't need these obviated variables any longer. And now we can move on to our actual task, which will be adding a placeholder. We are already accepting a title, which we can use as the placeholder text in our initializer. That's being accepted right here. All we have to do is render this out on the page somehow. There are multiple ways of doing this. We could add this to our omen text field rep, inserting it at the UI text view level, but that would involve us laying stuff out using UI kit code, which is generally harder to work with. And there's actually a purely Swift UI solution to this. All we have to do is wrap our text field in a Z stack and insert a text view that uses our title as its text. We can set the foreground color to color.secondary and have the opacity. Now let's run this. We have our placeholders there, but we want them to be aligned with top leading. And we also want them only to appear if the text is empty. So we can here say text that is empty, then we'll have them show. Otherwise, we'll have them be completely invisible. And let's also make sure there's no animation on these so it switches visibility immediately. Let's run this. And here we go. When we type, the placeholder disappears. Otherwise, it returns. And that looks great. And we didn't even have to change the UI kit code, which can be a little more difficult to work with. I found that the best way to work with Swift UI and UI kit is to only wrap when necessary. But if it's possible to do something purely in Swift UI in a way that doesn't seem to be too hacky or too brittle, and I think this qualifies, then stick to that. This was really easy to accomplish just using Z stacks. So there we go. That was surprisingly easy. Placeholder is now finished. Let's see what our next step was. Ah, yes, after placeholder, we needed to add an onCommit callback to our API. So far, there's no way to do anything when the user presses the return key. In fact, it just adds a new line, which is fine sometimes, but we'd like to make this overridable so that the user could move to the back field, perhaps, and then also submit or save whatever they're working on. So let's see how to do that. We need to go back to our omen text field implementation, and we have to add a new parameter called onCommit, which will be a function that takes no arguments, and we can actually have this be optional so that we can use the default behavior of inserting a new line. Because I've turned this into a Swift package, between videos I actually made this a public struct, and I had to make the initializer public, so now we'll have to add our new fields to this initializer as well. When you create libraries, you have to be more explicit about what you want to expose as the public API, which makes certain things a little more verbose. So let's go in here, add on commit, which is going to have the same type, and then we'll say that self.onCommit is equal to onCommit. And we can give this a default value of nil so it doesn't have to be specified. It's also worth noting while we're here that I've actually since last time made is focused an optional binding. And this is because it may not always be the most convenient to have to pass in a binding to is focused. Maybe we do not care whether or not it's focused. But when you use the binding syntax like this, you actually can't give it a default value, and it also always has to exist. So if you want to change a binding of a string to an optional binding, then you have to remove the property wrapper and specify the type manually. So in the last video, we had a binding of Boolean, but since we wanted to make this an optional binding, we had to totally remove the property wrapper. This is definitely less convenient than using the property wrapper. However, it gives us a much nicer API because now the caller of omen text field is not required to pass in a binding. We can use the binding just as we did before, except now we have to access wrapped value explicitly. So if the binding exists, we get the Boolean out of it, assign this to is focused, and then we can use is focused just as before. And when we want to assign to is focused, we also have to access the wrapped value. So in the end, working with the binding becomes a little more explicit. We lose some of the magic, but the trade-off is that we have a nicer API, and none of this nonsense is exposed to the caller of Omen text field. So we do a little more work internally in our library, but on the outside, 
we get a better, more flexible library. This is a trade-off you'll have to make. If you're not building a package, this won't always be necessary. You can just do whatever is the most convenient for your own app. But because I want this to be public, we've got to do a little more work on the inside. With that tangent out of the way, let's get back to onCommit. So we've added onCommit to our initializer, and we've assigned it to our variable here. And we're also going to have to pass this along as usual to our omen text field rep. So let's pass along onCommit, and then also add a property on the representative. So now the question is, where do we use onCommit? We'll have to go to our coordinator, and we can look for a UI text view delegate method that will be of use to us. Unfortunately, there's no text view did press return key or anything like that, and it turns out the one that we have to use is the slightly oddly named text view should change text in range, because this gives us access to the replacement text. And we can check if this replacement text is a new line character, that means that the user pressed return. It's a little awkward, but it's really all we have to work with. And this method also must return a Boolean, which, if you read the oddly worded message, implies true should be returned when we want the text to be replaced. So if we end up handling it, we probably want to return false. So first we have to check to see if we have an onCommit callback passed to us. So we can just bind here the reps onCommit. And we can also make sure that the text is equal to the new line character. If this is the case, then we can call onCommit and we can return false because we've handled this and we don't want to also insert a new line. And then at the end, we have to make sure that in any other case, we'll just return true. Everything compiles, so let's try to use this. Going back to our example view here, we can add an on commit to, say, the front in order to change the focus to the back. So in here, we'll simply say focus is equal to back. And this is also much nicer than it would have been if we didn't make that refactoring before. We would have had to both turn off the front focus and turn on the back focus. And it would have gotten more complicated the more text fields we were juggling. We can also add this on commit callback to the back and simply change the front text to empty as well as the back text and then we can nil out the focus. So this will simulate submitting whatever form this represents. So let's try this out. So now if I tap into the front, add some words, hit return, we don't insert the new line character, instead we jump to the back. And now if I add some more words and hit return, everything blanks out and we lose all focus. So that's exactly what we wanted. So now we've actually achieved parity with the built-in text field and obviously surpassed it. But this is a little awkward because if we click in here, we actually see that our return key says return, which is no longer what it's doing. It's actually first jumping us to the second field and then it's finishing and resetting both fields. The built-in SwiftUI text view also says return whether or not you add an on commit callback. And I think this is pretty awkward, but I can also understand why they just didn't do anything about it. So now we're on step three, which is adding this return key API. The reason why Apple didn't do anything about this, I believe, is because return key really only makes sense in the context of iOS. If you're using a text field on the Mac, your return key is on your keyboard. It's not customizable. It hasn't been replaced in a touch bar style fashion just yet. And SwiftUI tends to leave out platform specific code, especially in these overloaded initializers. This sort of makes sense because they want you to be able to write once and run anywhere. But that is always sort of a Faustian bargain, because your code must become so generic that it can run in any context. Then you lose the ability to make it work really nicely in any specific context. For instance, it always saying return, which is misleading, especially if it jumps you to another field or submits a form or something. UIKit itself makes this customizable and gives you a slew of options, including done, send, next, Google, search. You can change the built-in return key to be any one of these. And that makes for a more polished user experience. If your button says return, implying that it's about to insert a new line, but it jumps you to another field that's just weird. But this is the place where Swift UI feels sort of incomplete. I'm not sure if Apple has decided exactly which direction they want to take. It is, of course, a huge undertaking, and it is impressive what they've done so far, but it looks like if they haven't decided on an elegant solution, they sort of just hold back before making any decision, which, given their scale, makes a lot of sense. People would get very angry if they introduced APIs and then removed them in subsequent versions. So they have to be very careful when they introduce something, and they don't want to introduce the wrong abstraction. However, this leaves huge gaps, and it's not great to work with SwiftUI in the context of these gaps, especially if you want to make a polished app, which is my goal, and probably yours as well. So the question is, how do we integrate this? How do we allow the return key to be customizable when it only makes sense on one platform? There are a couple of ways to go about it. Let's start by taking a look at how Apple allows for platform-specific code. Let's look at the, the action sheet modifier. We'll see that this modifier actually just isn't available on macOS. It's only available on iOS, tvOS, and watchOS. So 
That's one way of going about doing something. We could, for instance, add a return key type modifier, which would only be usable in an iOS context. The only problem is that I really don't like how this forces you to write your code because now we can't just use action sheet in here. If we wanted this example view to work both on Mac and iOS, we couldn't simply just dot chain on action sheet. We would instead have to do something kind of clunky. We'd have to pull this whole thing out and have two implementations, one for iOS and one for Mac OS, which means we can't just do it all in line. We'd have to pull this out into some private variable that returns a view and it would look kind of awkward inside. So these platform specific modifiers don't compose very nicely with the view builder style. Perhaps there are some syntactic tricks I'm not aware of of making this nicer, but I don't like the way it forces me to contort the code. So let's ignore this possibility for now. Another option which Apple tends not to use is to make an overloaded constructor, a version that accepts return key that is only available on iOS, but that's the same problem as the platform specific modifier and that we would have to pull this out somewhere and have two different versions, one for iOS and one for macOS. So unfortunately, SwiftUI doesn't have a great answer for us here. It tends to either dodge the question or give us problematic answers. So I'm going to suggest another approach, which I can understand why Apple didn't take, because it perhaps is a little inelegant, especially if you scale it up to an entire suite, an entire library like SwiftUI. But I think it wins at the trade-offs, especially for a single package like this. And that would be to allow us to pass a return key type to Omen text field as a parameter on any platform and just simply ignore it on macOS. macOS can construct the values of return key types. It will be a multi-platform enum constructible on macOS, iOS, tvOS, any OS, even if there is no return key. And it will just simply be a no-op on the platforms where it doesn't make sense. So you can see how that's perhaps a little inelegant. You have this little vestigial dangling property that is unused on certain platforms. But from a developer experience perspective, it's quite nice because we don't have to change the structure of our code to work with it. The code is the same. It just happens to be a no-op on certain platforms. If this whole idea makes your skin crawl, I'd love to hear your thoughts, or perhaps you've found another way of accomplishing this. But I think the jury is out on the best way to organize these write once, run everywhere types of APIs. There are many trade-offs inherent to that structure. So we're either gonna have totally separate code bases, but if we want the convenience of a single code base, we're going to maybe have to deal with a little bit of awkwardness now and again in order to get the best experience on all platforms. But for now, let's just accept this approach and take a look at how to do it. Jumping into our Omen text field implementation, we're going to need to build a new enum, one which is going to represent all of the possible different values of return key. I'm actually going to scroll all the way to the bottom and hide this enum in an extension on Omen text field. And we're going to call this return key type. For now, let's just start with a few basic cases. We have default, we have next, we have return, we have done. And as you can see, some of these are pink, and that's because these are keywords. But if we accept the built-in hint, which by the way, I'm actually doing by hitting Command Option Control F, which is slightly awkward to hit, but I'd recommend building up the muscle memory because it's quite useful. It will automatically wrap these in backticks, which allows us to use these keywords as enum values. And now we can accept this in our initializer. So let's add a property called return key type to our text field, which will be one of these return key types. And we'll also accept it here. And we'll give it a default value of default. Ah, and because this is now a library and I've made the initializer public, any types that we use in the initializer will also have to be public. So let's go back to the bottom and make this a public enum. And now it's failing for a better reason, which is that we haven't yet set our return key type. So let's do that. And as usual, we have to pass this along to our omen text field rep. So let's paste this return key type in here. And let's specify that this is an omen text field dot return key type because this rep is not nested within the extension and now it's missing here so if i hit that awkward keyboard combination again it'll get me this and i can use return key type and now as usual after we've drilled down these many layers we can finally in our omen text field rep use this return key type so when we first make the view we want to set our ui views return key to our return key type. However, there's a problem in that the UI views return key type is a UI return key type. So we can add a method to our return key to translate it into UI gets return key. We'll make a computed variable called UI type. And now let's actually implement this. So I'm gonna make a variable called UI type, which is going to be a UI return key type. And we're going to have to switch on ourselves. Default is going to be default and so on and so forth. Let me copy this so we don't get RSI or anything. Man, I really wish Xcode had a Vim plugin. Oh, and I forgot, there actually is no return property. I think return is actually default. So we can get rid of that case for now. 
There are a few other variants of UI return key type, but I'm going to leave those off for now. But I've actually already added them to the package that's on GitHub, so feel free to check that out. Of course, this will also only be available in the context of iOS. So we can wrap this in this little compile time guard, making sure that our OS is iOS. And so only on iOS will we have this method. Of course, in this version, we haven't yet built the NS view. This is also, once again, in the GitHub package. So in GitHub, this version of the omen text field rep is actually separated out into its own file. And there is another similar, though obnoxiously different version for AppKit, which uses an NS view representable. And you can take a look at that. There are some boring little differences in the way that you have to implement some of these functions just due to the differences between UIKit and AppKit. And all of the duplication and awkwardness and pain you can witness for yourself there reminds us of the promise of being able to use SwiftUI on all platforms. And if we must do a little bit of eldritch magic on the inside of our libraries to get it all to work, then so be it. We'll do that and then we'll forget about it using a nicely designed interface on the outside. So we can leave all of our PTSD behind us and enjoy a beautiful API. And before we run this, we might actually anticipate that we want to change the return key type. So we can also in here check to see if the UI views return key type is not equal to our return key types UI type, then we can override it once again. And as usual, there are some unexpected quirks of UIKit. So every time we end up changing this return key type, we also have to call reload input views. Otherwise that change will not appear. The version of this code on GitHub goes through a few of these other quirks, and you might see some random calls to dispatch queue async. And this was all just trying to get this to work in as many contexts as possible. Unfortunately, that impedance mismatch between SwiftUI's declarative syntax and UIKit's imperative one means that they don't always mesh perfectly on the first try, and you have to add some odd delays here and there in order to make sure everything is synced up behind the scenes. So far, my go-to heuristic is to add that dispatch queue main async call around certain functions that may modify UI views. Sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. Sometimes it makes things look a little glitchy. Sometimes it fixes things. The only way to find out is really to use it and then to turn it off and to compare it. It's not the most fun type of coding, but if you want your apps to look good, it's kind of what you have to do. I can't remember if we need this here right now, and I don't feel like testing it, but it does exist in the GitHub repo. So take a look there if you're curious. Okay, so now we can finally use this. Let's go back to the example view and let's add the right return key types. Here, return key type, we want this to be next for the first one. There's actually a problem here. Things are in the wrong order. So let's jump back very quickly and move return key type above on commit so we can use that in the trailing closure syntax. And we also have to do that here. So let's move this up here, add a comma, format it. And now it compiled. So let's go back and also add return key type done to the back. And let's run this and see what it looks like. So if I tap into the front, we'll see that the key says next, which is perfectly descriptive and not confusing. And then in the back, it says done, and it's nice and big and blue and beautiful, and you just want to click it, and everything has been deleted as intended. So there you have it. That was quite the odyssey, but now we've really built a usable, complete version of this. Obviously, this implementation only works for iOS, but as I've said, on GitHub, you can take a look at how the code has to grow slightly more awkward in order to account for both Mac and iOS implementations. I hope this has been interesting. There are certainly lots of tutorials that go into aspects of what I've gone over today, but I haven't found many that involve working on something that's attempting to be usable in production. And I think that gives you a different flavor of how these things work. SwiftUI is something that demos very, very well, but there are a lot of weird edge cases and corner cases as you attempt to use it in production across multiple platforms. Occasionally, you'll find out that the paved road ends much sooner than you would have expected it to. But over the past year and a half, I suppose it's been since I've been working with SwiftUI, I've learned a few tricks and I hope you found them useful. So, um, like and subscribe. If you're into it, um, no pressure by any means, of course. I think the next video I'm going to make is actually going to walk through building the Swift UI app, but not just a little toy one, one that would actually be production worthy to some degree, or at least as an open source app. I was thinking of making one of these text snippet apps where you can anywhere just type something like, for instance, X name or X email, some sort of special code word, which would then get deleted and replaced with, you know, your, your email address or your name. There are a bunch of these, including Text Expander and Typeinator and Alfred, and uh, even Xcode has this ability. So yeah, it's kind of like this, except global. So when I can just type in DQA and get myself this dispatch Q main async, this would be usable anywhere. But that's a pretty non-trivial 
app. I mean, it's it's a nice balance. Um, I looked into it, and I think it's something we can do. And I don't think there are many tutorials out there for building a real app that runs on the Mac from start to finish. There are so many edge cases that you just do not learn in the Happy Path tutorials that are on YouTube. So I hope that's something that people would find useful. I know, I think I would have had I come across something like that a couple of years ago. And that's kind of my goal. And while I'm up here giving a weird speech, I'd just like to thank the, the people who commented on Reddit and uh, on YouTube. Um, said really nice things. It is a, a surprising amount of work to record a video, and it really made it worth it. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to make another one, but it was really uh, oddly touching to receive the nice comments, so I really appreciate that. And yeah, I'll see you next time. Take care.